do our my bees uh, unique to us, uh, unique in the world, or we follow other model of CHM? Uh, first question. Second question. Uh, what about information security? Uh, meaning that uh, what level of uh, sensitiveness, yeah, if I can say that, regarding the information uh, being deposited into my base? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Alison, uh, in your uh, speech just now, you are talking about uh, linked skill. Linked skill. Li li linked skill. Um, yeah, w I, I, I did several uh, survey, uh, visitor survey, and then and I found out that uh, they don't really like to be extremist, meaning they don't like to say, I really like it, uh, or I, I don't like it, rather than they are in the middle, yeah. like moderate. So I always uh, avoid to put uh, moderate answer, you know, like like fifty fifty answer. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Yeah. So berkaitan dengan uh, standard yang data uh, sama ada perlu ikut MyBiz punya ke ataupun agensi. Sebenarnya uh, kita tak ada halangan untuk agensi membekalkan apa apa saja jenis data. Sebab data yang kita terima kita akan masaskan balik mengikut keperluan lah. Uh, mungkin data tu uh, buat sementara ni tak perlu lagi dalam analisis tapi kita akan guna pada kemudian hari so kita akan integrate sekali uh, uh, biasanya kita bila bekerjasama dengan agensi kita akan berbincang balik apa jenis data yang ada dan apa yang MyBiz uh, perlukan uh, so kita akan tengok dari segi keperluan macam itulah uh, and then yang soalan kedua berkaitan dengan uh, keselamatan data kalau dalam MyBiz kita ada uh, uh, CMS kita main content management system lah Bermaksud uh, ada setengah data yang memang kita tak publish kepada publik lah. Uh, tujuan dia supaya untuk untuk uh, expert, kegunaan expert sahaja dalaman sistem melalui login page lah. So bermaksud data-data sensitif ni memang kena berdaftar dengan MyBiz dulu baru boleh access. Dan user dalam MyBiz ada lima kategori lah. Uh, yang paling tinggi super admin yang akan mengawal uh, data masuk dan keluar. Lepas tu kita ada administrator untuk pengurusan data entry, kita ada RA dan expert untuk uh, uh, kita punya expert login dan kita ada RA punya bahagian. So saya rasa untuk keselamatan server memang kita uruskan uh, server 24 jam 7 hari lah uh, yang memang kita kawal dan kita backup setiap hari. Dan kalau nak ikutkan uh, server yang kita ada memang memang sangat uh, sangat sangat sesuai lah maksudnya yang yang terbaik lah dan server yang kita ada tu pun boleh me, menyimpan uh, data sebesar uh, 17 gig pada satu masa uh, bermaksud kalau gambar yang ada dalam MyBiz adalah gambar asal sebenarnya yang daripada owner tu maksud kita bukannya kompreskan dia ke apa kan kita akan repository gambar asal cuma yang kita publish balik dekat dalam MyBiz yang kita generate balik dengan watermark uh, copyright lah so untuk keselamatan tu memang kita kita titik beratlah dan kita kita pun bekerjasama dengan mampu untuk memastikan kita punya data ni mengikut standard yang ditetapkan so Dr Naimi ada nak tambah nak tambah sikit je um, my base is owned by NRE but the data is owned by the information providers let's say uh, Jabatan Hutan Sabah provide us with the data. The data is owned by uh, Jabatan Hutan. And uh, Jabatan Hutan uh, Sabah will determine the level of assessment. Uh, let's say uh, well, kita, kita ada uh, five tiers. Uh, Jabatan Hutan Sabah kata hanya sampai tier two saja yang boleh kita uh, disclose to public. So that we will apa ni uh, enable until tier 2 only yang lain-lain tu akan digunakan for jabatan sabah uh, jabatan hutan sabah untuk dia management uh, ya yeah. so apa ni itulah konsep perkongsiannya uh, we build the house uh, semua equipment tu actually belongs to the respective authorities and agencies and uh, regarding uh, security aspect actually we are working with mampu uh, uh, and uh, memang kita um, fulfill all the uh, security 
aspect in uh, data management. Uh, and we also working with Mampu to ensure that we can put the data and the pusat data uh, sector awam uh, very soon. Thank you very much. Yes, that was regarding the Likert, Likert scale. Um, I think that it is noted, it, there's research on, on that, that that's human nature, that people don't want to be extreme in either way, particularly ne negative. They're not as likely to say that they extremely dislike something. And that's something you'd take into, and we didn't go into it much today, of where to work out where your mean sits. But we talked about that the... Um, you know, the benchmark for West Australian parks would be 85% satisfaction, and that would be taking into account where the, where the mean's going to sit, where, where, you know, what's the middle of the road, what's the minimum we'll accept. For a lot of those questions where there's a roundabout, where there's, you know, five responses, you'd probably be wanting to weight it up around between 3.6 and 4 for, for what's acceptable. Um, and to be above that is exceeding, but it, it just depends, you know, and you'll, each survey will work out, you know, what works for you. Does that help? Yeah. Hi, I'm Salvia from SFC Sarawak. So my question goes to the first speaker and might be uh, for the second speaker. You can both, you can answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, this question is actually about uh, management, management plan. So I would like to know in your opinion, your professional opinion, what is the difference between the management plan and master plan? So is it necessary to have a master plan if you already have a management plan in protected areas? Okay, thank you. That's, I mean, these are terminologies master plan, management plan, operational plan, so many terms. So I think if you look across uh, different countries and even during different time periods, they will use uh, different terms. So uh, I, mentioned I mentioned this guidance document by uh, Lee Thomas. So in there, they did explain a little bit about all these the technologies. You can, you can look to that. But uh, master plan sometimes have... Uh, 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 it has a certain inclination towards development, developmental planning, like you know, like uh, you know, master plan for a site, you know, where you have buildings, whatever that. But management plan, I think, is a better term because the emphasis on management, you know, not, it's not so much more on development, uh, and also the word master plan may sound like it's a bit top down. Master plan, oh, I'm the master. This is the plan you follow, you know, something like that. You want to add? Thank you, uh, Mr. Surim. To me, it's just uh, like uh, Dr. Surim was mentioning, master plan. It's, it's uh, on the macro level, like tourism master plan. But for you to decide whether you want to do a master plan or even a, a management plan, which is more spice specific, it depends on how much money do you have. Kalau banyak itu duit, by all means, do it. You want to do this master plan, that master plan, and you have all the uh, armies and the generals with you. Unfortunately for, for forestry, I think SFC included, is we do not have even the luxuries of time. Okay? We don't have the luxury of time. We don't even have the luxury of manpower. You're given, okay. Your boss will say, okay, Salvia, I give you two years, I don't care how you do it, come back with me a master plan. Nah. Or then if you are a, 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 a young officer, then you, you would say, okay, I will do it. Do not take instruction face value. Please, answer back your boss, then that'll make you a good officer. Jangan ikut si ini. Dia kasih kau dua juta, kasih kau dua puluh ribu. So, I hope that answer your question. All right, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, it's not. Uh, it's not too much on the questions. More on the to share some experience uh, for the my piece. It's not about the my piece. About the data uh, sharing of the biodiversity data. Um, many years ago, I was involved. Maybe you heard about Encyclopedia of Life. It's a project initiated by E. O. Wilson. And the idea was proposed in 2008, and it's become 
uh, is then the, the, the Encyclopedia of Life database established in 2010. And I was uh, one of the first fellow that uh, sponsored by the Smithsonian Institution. So I can, uh, during the time that I was involved and actually I'm not involved in the development of database, but to try to supply the data. So I can see uh, they, they make a lot of mistakes and they learn of the things there. So what I'm seeing that um, what is lacking actually when you construct this kind of the database and you, when we want to ask people to contribute the data, I can tell you that no one will going to contribute the data because um, for anyone to contribute the data to a data database, it's going to take them a lot of time. Yeah. So what they did actually, first they have the database, like what you did. At the same time, they developed a platform, still online, which allow anyone, anyone basically, to open an account and start to key in their data. Okay. Then once they key in the data, then this is their database, their own online database. I have my own online database. Then from time to time, the Encyclopedia of Life will harvest all the data. Okay. And regarding to the data security, actually the idea is that if you don't want to share the data, that better not to put it online, regardless what kind of the security that you have. It just make a lot of trouble. So and another thing is, um, if you want to share the data, share it openly. Okay, you should not put any restriction because they will cause a lot of the problem later for the administrative labor. So this is what they learn. So now all the data that we share, you have, once you put online, then you agree that your data will be uh, licensed under the CC, uh, common creative. So con con uh, and CC BY, it's even better if you want to share it as a public domain. That means there's no copyright at all. And so now, now this thing is established actually. So I can see that the MIB is going to face in this problem. So you're going to have prepare to prepare a platform. Yeah. Because otherwise you will be overloaded with all those administration. People will just keep going and share the things. And but what is missing actually, so you have the online platform for individual to upload data, but somehow it's still double work. So I, I in a normal day I just make my report at the same time why I need to do it again. So this is what is missing. And now we are currently developing a local database which allow you to open in your computer. Just use Microsoft Access, we develop a database. And after that, you just output the file, export the template, I mean the data in the template that recognized by the, the platform that we use is Scratchpad, it's developed by the European Union. And any one of the source. At the same time, the SQL video of life, you pick up all the data from GMAN, GBIF, Biodiversity Heritage Library, so everything is there. So it's just like a Google for the species. Yeah. So I think this is the things that um, maybe my piece should look into it because uh, you come come to you soon or later. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Han from UNDP. Um, the question is directed to Dr. Nahim about the my bees because it's a database of species. So how? How do you handle the voucher specimen? Because after three years of uh, collecting the data, let's say some researchers want to verify, validate whether the species are correctly identified, but they have to refer to the voucher specimen. So since the initiative of developing a natural history museum has been queued off, then um, keeping the voucher specimen become a big issue, not just keeping, but curating and maintaining it. How, how my business can you, you know, address this issue? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank so Dr. Liu for uh, your uh, very positive uh, response, and we will take into account your suggestion uh, in further developing our uh, my uh, Regarding the biodiversity scientific uh, collection, uh, nowadays, actually, we are working with a number of uh, key uh, scientific collection centers, uh, namely uh, Rainbow Elmo uh, University Maraya, and we are also developing uh, a number of uh, experts, which can uh, verify all the database. And uh, as initial uh, phase, we do provide them with uh, uh, some some funding. For, for them actually to uh, improve their scientific uh, collection. 
uh, and at the same time we are working uh, with um, uh, Jabatan Museum Malaysia uh, and also uh, ministry nowadays also uh, are trying to materialize the idea of having NHM National History Museum. So by having a, a, a very conducive environment nowadays, I think we'll, we can keep uh, the watcher specimen in a very proper manner. Uh, and at the same time, we can uh, develop uh, expert skill in the respective uh, areas. Can I follow it? Just a short remark. OK. OK, can. Yeah, yeah, of course. So um, throughout my experience, after three or four years, when I go back to check the voucher specimen, most of them are badly maintained or disappear or data wrongly recorded. I would suggest maybe it might be develop some guideline saying that if your voucher specimen disappear, your data, that particular data would be removed or something along that line to encourage the proper maintenance of the voucher specimen, which forms the very important basis for science, scientific investigation in biology science. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I forgot to mention to you that uh, a group of these uh, collection centers uh, have uh, produced a guideline uh, or manual, uh, my guideline, my collection guidelines, uh, actually to inculcate the best practices. And uh, I hope that um, all other collection centers can also use this uh, guideline because this guideline is also adopted uh, from uh, a number of um, key collection centers uh, which are prominent uh, throughout the world. Thank you very much. Thank you to both presenters. I'm Bun Ratna from Mahidon University. I have one question each to uh, one question to each presenter. All right, to the first presenter, how do you address transboundary and non-transboundary poachers that have masterminds or criminal warlords that support <gasps> their time away? Let's say when they're arrested for a few couple of months, they're covered. Their expenses are already covered. They also have budget to pay for the penalties or corruption, whatever. So how do you address this? That's to the first presenter. To the second presenter, now drone is a very effective tool, it's a very powerful tool, but I strongly believe that it's not an alternative to ground patrolling, all right? The traditional ground patrolling is a must because the batteries last 30 minutes. How many sets of batteries can you take into deep into the forest Plus, most of the operation of the drone is by the river, main river, and main roads. And poachers, professional poachers, let's say from Vietnam and Cambodia, they will establish their camps high up in the water sources, away from the main water source. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, t when I say transboundary, I'm talking about from different countries, because we know there's uh, operations from say Vietnamese poachers are coming to Thailand and Malaysia for wildlife and garu wood. Cambodian poachers are coming to Malaysia for garu wood, all right? And they have business uh, supporters in Vietnam, Laos, uh, Malaysia and Thailand. And uh, at the border, let's say between Thailand and Malaysia, the villagers are assisting, the border police is assisting, the military is escorting these poachers right through the protected area. So this is a very high operation. So we are talking about very big monies involved and uh, the poachers are already aware that they'll be supported if they get uh, arrested or penalized, spend a couple of months in the forest because to find good professional poachers is difficult. And the criminals, the masterminds support them, let's say that when it comes to wildlife hunting, support them with high powered rifles, uh, spotting scope and night vision and silences. These are the things that happen. Thank you. Good, thank you for the question. Um, um, if, I, if I'm talking about um, under Pahilitan jurisdiction, um, the coverage of our protected area is not uh, at the border, that's one thing. Um, yeah, we do have a question about the transboundary, um, uh, I mean, foreign people uh, 
doing illegal things in, in our soil. Um, yeah, it's a big business. Um, the, even the, f the fine is considered quite high, but they're still able to pay. Uh, that is why we have to find a other mechanism to overcome all these uh, transboundary, um, I mean, uh, foreign people, uh, uh, illegal harvest uh, in, in our uh, protected area. Uh, but right now, um, uh, for Pihilitan, we, we only have uh, the Wildlife Conservation Act, uh, all the penalties in there. Uh, and also, all our uh, national park, ha we have our own enactment. Um, and this year, uh, we are open up to uh, more uh, network. Uh, we have one, uh, there's a network for enforcement. Uh, we have ASEAN WEN uh, to, to help us. Uh, in dealing with these uh, transboundary uh, things. Okay, yeah. uh, Zimbo, just to, to respond to your uh, uh, concern, um, the drone does does not mean to replace, uh, does not meant to replace uh, the uh, ground stuff. So this is actually, well, as you said, a tool. So, um, this uh, it's actually act as a force multiplier to to the uh, uh, ground team because as you can see from uh, Abu's presentation and and later in the afternoon um, there's a presentation about smart we still have um, we still deploy um, a huge number of uh, uh, staff on the ground because um, we cannot afford to simply depend on the drone because as you said, um, there's, even though there's uh, advantages in using uh, drones, but there, there's also a limitation to what it can do. So um, that I think that's, that's my response. Uh, Cik Taufik, can you just maybe let us know what are the limitations uh, to using drones? Okay. Uh, limitation. Yeah. First of all, even though it's a, a low cost uh, um, aircraft, but you still need some budget to um, buy batteries, spare parts, because as you can see from the video during the landing, um, a few things might come out. <laughs> so, so um, you need to replace uh, some parts, and then um, you need to have some technical skill to to be able to do uh, small maintenance, um, and then um, a battery. Bat battery also is not that cheap, but uh, and and with uh, you have to take proper uh, care so to make it last longer and also uh, depends on the uh, weather condition so uh, if there's a strong wind then you, you cannot fly your, your mission because uh, it might end up somewhere okay morning I'm Mr. Arosh I'm representing the MNS Penang branch I have a question for the two speakers the first is to Inchit Taufik uh, <clears throat> given the limitations of the battery life on drones, and that's a worldwide limitation, like unless you have the one, like they have the military, which is an exception, uh, are they considering working with the uni research universities on maybe doing con combining ro drones with some kind of platform, meaning a uh, launch platform? One concept would be actually using a combination of hot air balloons and drones, where actually the drone is released from a hot air balloon, so the drone can be in the air longer, all right, and of course they have to have a mechanism of retrieval. So that way, if one of these ideas is because of the limitation, it's also a cheaper solution. You could use hydrogen balloons, all right, and then work out a system whereby a drone can be released to extend its life. That's the question with regards to drones. 
Um, so is there any, any is there any possibility of doing a research or joint venture with our local universities to explore that idea? The second is to inche Mr. Abu, inche Abu. Um, <clears throat> with regards to enforcement, um, from the last slide where we talked about, I was looking at the penalties. First of all, this ambient, one ambient project is, I think, very good. Okay, but going, I have two sub, two questions here. One, from the penalties, is there engagement with the judiciary to actually increase the penalties? Because if you look at a guy, he is taking millions of dollars out of of wildlife or gaharu, and they get two months, three months, twenty-five thousand chicken feet. All right. So unless, I know the maximum uh, uh, fines are very high, but they don't seem to be enforced. And I think you, I think one thing MBON should engage is the judiciary to make them aware that they have to be stiffer penalties to really discourage because the ROI is very high. The other thing about one MBON, I think, and I think this is one of the, <coughs> well, I will say the weaknesses in government institutions, you tend to always engage yourselves, meaning, one institution and government body engaging another institution. I think more needs to be done between the government institutions engaging the NGOs and the community to get them involved. All right? Because they, we are, as NGOs, we always feel there's an invisible barrier between the NGO community or the community when dealing with government institutions. We feel that in, in part of this one MEO program, maybe you can consider in one of the phases to extend this um, cooperation, be it for intelligence gathering, or be it for you know the handling of trafficking, by engaging the communities and getting them involved. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, and congratulations for the board's of presenter. Uh, presenter. Uh, my name is My Paul Spite. I'm from the uh, Sabah Parks. I'm also in charge of the uh, enforcement and uh, crisis management. So, uh, any uh, my input on, on the uh, most of the uh, in uh, poacher uh, gaharu yang ambil gaharu, and then uh, bila kita bawa dalam uh, prosecution, uh, normally the judges, uh, for example, in Sabah Parks. Uh, but the maximum penalty is 500,000 with uh, five years in prison. But the charges, when I bring the, uh, brought this uh, case, normally the ch charges only uh, 10,000. Yeah, so it's, the gap is very huge, you know. So uh, we intend uh, to do the, what they call amendment of the park enactment, uh, so that uh, at least, for example, uh, uh, the penalty not less then 15,000, for example, like that. So uh, at least they are the peto, sakit sakit lah. So the second thing is the uh, the law of the national parks. Uh, our friend said that this is a strategic law tan biru, uh, which involved the the army and all the uh, enforcement agency. Uh. Uh, in Sabah Park also we apply this one. For example, in Taman Tun Sakaran in Simporna. The Taman Marine Tun Sakaran is one of the in, included the ex zone area. Uh, so most of the time the uh, police uh, uh, SCOM enforce the uh, what they call curve. Uh, so the park ranger uh, sometimes Tidak uh, dapat, we lack of shortage of manpower. So most of time the uh, the the police uh, young catch the all the 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 poacher. Huh? But the question is, uh, adakah police or escom mempunyai kuasa uh, menangkap di dalam kawasan taman? Uh, I don't know in in uh, taman negara Semenanjung. So when we involve uh, military uh, army. Is there have any power to arrest uh, the poacher inside the park area? So, with that, uh, recently I present the uh, amendment of the park enactment, uh, also same to the uh, wildlife department of Sabah. We uh, wildlife is already uh, gazette. Uh, we extend the power to uh, the police to all the. Uh, 
government officer, uh, wildlife or parks or forestry uh, officer, uh, boleh menangkap uh, res uh, uh, yang membuat kesalahan di dalam kawasan protected area. That's the second uh, my point lah. Uh, the third one is the um, the drone, eh? the drone. Uh, drone is very advanced technology. We also uh, use this uh, drone, uh, but the drone is only the what they call uh, uh, supporting tools for the enforcement. Uh, memang kita tidak boleh deny that the the ranger patrolling on ground is still the best. But the drone uh, is provide the preliminary uh, info to the enforcement team so that they can planning, they can manage where to exist, how to do that, and so on. But maybe one day, uh, the drone can be update, upgrade, so that the drone can detect the poacher, the orangutan in the forest cover. Maybe through the body heat, maybe through maybe the research body, uh, university can do something like that. So if we have this one, and then maybe uh, more effective in terms of the uh, in term encroachment in the park area. So all this, the point is we must uh, send the strength in faster message to the poacher, including the local community. Thank you. So I'll respond to um, uh, both the question. Um, well, as in all uh, technology, it keeps on uh, evolving, and uh, as time goes uh, moves on, then um, the technology will uh, de develop further. So um, that's it's possible to use. Uh, hot air balloon or hydrogen balloon to, to as a launch platform for drones but I think due to the uh, uh, design of the uh, software it, uh, you can launch it but it might not come back to you uh, because of the distance and the way they design the, the software you have to uh, manually uh, key in all the uh, waypoints where your home waypoint is so that the drone will know where to uh, land when they, after um, the mission is complete. Uh, and uh, as for my pull, your uh, question today is, uh, I think really related to the payload, uh, the sensor. Um, um, there is other sensor such as thermal, um, but the issue is cost, uh, high cost, because and and another thing is the the um, weight and size of the uh, payload. Um, you need to have something small so that you can fit on the drone. So anything bigger or uh, heavier will um, will affect the uh, will affect the uh, performance of the aircraft so that's that's one thing and then um, um, of, uh, if if you look at uh, in the website there's a there's still ongoing research on uh, further development of the drone technology so among them is to equip the drone with uh, like Wi-Fi uh, network so that they can fly over the uh, camera trap area and retrieve the images from the uh, from the camera trap. So uh, and on the software side, they um, well, I also have an idea of having a special algorithm to. Let's say fly over the uh, mud flat, uh, um, take the picture of the uh, shorebirds, and then process through the software to count how many birds available. But 
I I I need a software specialist lah to de to develop that kind of. A, but it can be done. I think it it has been applied to uh, orangutan research also. So they use a special uh, software to uh, to to count how many uh, nest in in the study area. So uh, that's that's my uh, response. To respond to our uh, friend from MNS question, um, yeah, no doubt, um, because it's involved uh, uh, big money, uh, big business, they normally uh, could easily pay uh, the fine. But then again, uh, we have to work in the dalam uh, lingkungan, uh, the law itself. The enactment that we're using is actually very old. Uh, and the fine is very low. But then again, um, if you find something, uh, uh, a violation act under the uh, Wildlife Conservation Act, we already uh, did amendments on the penalties in the uh, uh, Wildlife Conservation Act to th in, in 2010. Mm. <coughs> yeah, um, and we also Jalankan uh, uh, Satu program uh, kesedaran. This is uh, the awareness program program among uh, judiciary. Punya ini. Uh, we have uh, like dialogue and and we bring all the lawyers, uh, all the hakim, the magistrate. Uh, we explain to them uh, the importance of natural resources. Our uh, priceless uh, natural resources that's how um ia dapat memberi uh, kata apa uh, kesedaran bahawa uh, how important for them to put uh, uh, the maximum fines and uh, to your question um, about involving ngos and local uh, uh, public in uh, the enforcement work we did uh, involve uh, uh, public and NGO in uh, in this enforcement uh, work, but it's not uh, bila menangkap dan sebagainya, because we we just uh, we just can't give uh, the authority to anyone, but they can always help the authority, uh, the enforcement authority through uh, providing information. Yeah, we do have uh, informers uh, uh, di kalangan public and there is one NGO that uh, working on gathering information uh, on illegal trafficking and, and uh, illegal encroachment uh, in protected areas. I think uh, it's a Rimba, it's in Terengganu. They are working on gathering inform, uh, information on this, uh, this thing. And they, they channel the information to us. Therefore, it will help us to um, take action. And then, um, to answer uh, my poll uh, question, berkenaan dengan what's that again? Power to, power to arrest in protected areas. Oh, power to arrest in protected areas. Um, bila kita buat one and beyond, um, the army don't have the power to arrest. That's why uh, kita combine. Bila, uh, bagi, uh, this is true experience when we do uh, operation, uh, say we, we found a camp with, with uh, poachers inside. Um, normally, the first action is to catch them uh, was done by the army because it involved uh, dalam serbuan ada pergelutan. That's why our rangers would just stay away uh, and let the army do their uh, uh, resting. But the power to arrest is only um, kuasa menangkap is only ada pada our ranger. Sebabnya um, authority untuk menangkap ini uh, ranger itu akan digazetkan di bawah akta. Uh, it involves a uh, gazetment. That's that's why uh, if any other 
enactment yang melibatkan enforcement they always uh, satu clause sana uh, dia menggazetkan seseorang untuk uh, ada kuasa menangkap uh, it's like police is the same uh, seseorang itu perlu digazetkan so kalau tak ada dia perlu amendment di dalam uh, uh, akta atau enactment itu sendiri perlu ada an, uh, amendment of the uh, itulah uh, kuasa menangkap uh, i think i jawab kot soalan tu eh ha, right. i would like to address uh, this question to mr abu uh, this is uh, referring to your slide tentang anggaran nilai kehilangan akibat uh, daripada aktiviti pencerobohan dan pemburuan so, um, how did you come about with the 100 million figure? What type of analysis do you use? And can you elaborate more on the how? what is the method you use to come about with the 100 million figure? So, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Irma. Um, it's actually um, the figure that we get is um, we did very simple calculation. Um, first, we have been collecting all the data since I think about uh, 10 years uh, and we do have our um, price list for every species for every trees being cut kita ada harga dah yang kita dah set uh, the price we get is uh, we derive from the market uh, even pegaharu daripada market value uh, and also uh, timber value kita derive tu daripada harga-harga uh, uh, di pasaran lah uh, hidupan liar pula we do have uh, like our price even on tiger even on on bear biles apa semua animal parts we do have seharga yang tertentu yang kita dah uh, letakkan so every time we uh, we confiscate things or we found old uh, camp yang masih ada itu semua we our rangers have to uh, buat detail punya apa yang dijumpai dan apa that's how we uh, dapat harga tu lah it's, it's actually a simple calculation direct calculation but we, you, do, you have to have uh, Peraturan jelah senarai harga tu lah uh, untuk you translatekan berapa you punya loss. <laughs> thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, it's, it's actually not a, a question. It's just a clarification. As far as uh, Terengganu are concerned, the enactment on wildlife is being uh, amended, and the state government basically agreed on the uh, amended uh, penalties up to one million jail up to 20 years and also caning this one was proposed by the uh, uh, pelitan so it will go through probably takes probably another six to uh, nine months to to be adopted at the state level okay and then as far as the involvement of all the the uh, what we call um, other agencies in terms of in terms of jurisdiction uh, under the Act, we can also add, like the one being made by Sabah Park. Even in the, the Forestry Act, uh, we allow the police uh, to arrest people violating Akta Putana Negara. I think Pilitan should also do the same on their Act, so that the uh, jurisdiction will go by the police and also by the army. Thank you. Thank you. I think, uh, Tuan, you mean in enactment Taman Negara, right? You're referring to the... Uh, enactment Taman Negara Terengganu. Terengganu. Yes. Okay. Because all the states have their different enactment Taman Negara. In there, there's one in Kelantan, there's also one in Pahang. Okay. So as far as uh, Terengganu are, are, are concerned, we have already met uh, and they have already tabled the proposal to the state government and then basically the state government agreed because it's an increase to the penalty and also um, the what we call um, uh, charges. Yes. Just to add to uh, that one. So, um, well, actually we have uh, already started to uh, engage all um, 
dis start discussing with this all three state LAs to review the uh, uh, Taman Negara uh, enactment lah because uh, following the uh, NBOS initiative um, as you can see uh, we have been uh, uh, asked in in the summit we have uh, we managed to catch around 80 but somehow the uh, the uh, penalty is very low so but we there's uh, we can't do much except we we have to start um, uh, engaging the state uh, government to uh, to review the the enactment lah. that's 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 how it uh, get started lah. Uh, and uh, so far, like uh, Terengganu has uh, responded, Pahang has responded. We we are currently waiting uh, response from from Kelantan. So hopefully, um, we'll um, we'll be able to increase the penalty lah because uh, the the enactment is um, an old enactment. 1939-38 so there's there's even a difference in penalty in Pahang uh, it's slightly um, higher 10,000 but Pahang uh, but in Terengganu and Kelantan it's still um, $500 dollars <laughs> uh, uh, okay uh, since time is very short I'll revert some of my question to a comments rather uh, so the I have one comment for the first two speakers, all right? Now, you've got a system whereby you, you talk about security for the smart, all right? Now, to be honest, the, sm the smart security is not secure enough because there are syndicates out there who hire professional hackers to get access to the data. So there has been poaching of tigers in Russia and Lao based on the syndicate that has paid the professional hackers. So this, you might want to consider installing other security. All right, just a concern. And uh, just for sharing information here, one of your donor, Pantera, all right? Uh, you might know this person, uh, Jolo. All right, he's the board of director of Pantera and he's using your money to fund you and other things everywhere else. Now to the, sec to the third speaker, uh, can the system be used for detecting various types of habitats, uh, forest types in uh, an area that we have very little knowledge about? Okay. And for the fourth speaker, uh, the feeding on the palm, was it because of the availability of that palm, seasonal availability of that palm, or was it a keystone resource because other fruits were not, preferred fruits were not available? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Surin dari ProForest. Eh? So, dua soalan. Satu untuk Fadu. Uh, so, my question is, um, data that you enter tu, can it be fake tak? Is there any possibility? Because you selalu download daripada GPS kan? But can you fake the GPS data? Uh, itu soalan. And then, um, my other question for Yap. Okay, you said that uh, Malaysia has 10 hornbill species. Myanmar 11, Philippines, oh Myanmar 10, Philippines, 10 also, but in Myanmar and the, and the Philippines, are those 10 species found in one spot or in different spots? So can we say that Ulumudan and Bloom has the highest concentration of hornbill in one location? And is that worldwide as well? That's my other question, thanks. Yeah, this is about uh, actually about GPS data. I guess it covers both in the smart system and the other system. I mean, we are also on a, working on a small project and one of the ethical questions came up to me or one of the moral questions came up is, do I share GPS data or not? Because uh, we were doing in botany and the worry is if we share the GPS data in, a, in one of the local places, then it may actually bring people to collect the botanic species. So for people who are trying to record and do something good, all right, and conservation, it falls a moral uh, conundrum or paradigm, uh, sorry, 
conundrum as to whether to share the data or maybe just partially share the total reading. I, okay, this is the question that we have. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, appreciate the what said the scientific work in done towards uh, what's that uh, the law enforcement eh? because uh, uh, because it gives some kind of uh, what's that uh, assessment to uh, to see how effective the law enforcement work it is but uh, so I would like to thank and also would like to thank the what's that the, the, the project what's that for giving this. Uh, Cameras for for yeah, guna again. Camera so nampak macam effective lah for the untuk apa monitor. Tapi ya siapa maybe ya maybe can answer the siap the monitoring scientific monitoring tu. I mean we want to monitor a lot of things in the is for the knowledge sake, and uh, we have experienced that in the past also. Uh, to count, I mean, uh, the two-sided coin, lah. to count is to uh, either to protect or sometimes the counting can also lead to killing. Lah. So uh, I think the enforcement part of it, uh, the, the first part of the, the two speakers one, is how do we get uh, continuous law enforcement done with various type of petrol, and in this case, uh, to use this whatever smart technology and all that to ensure this all these nests are all uh, continuously patrol ranges continuously patrol them, and ensure that the the horn bills are there. If not, what will happen is that uh, like what we did, we counted 60 over rhinos all over the peninsula in the 80s and 90s, and Everybody knew where it were, and we didn't have patrolling. Basically, uh, the other one is Fauzul. Boleh ke kita also analyze berapa banyak satu range? I think last time we tried to do satu range boleh jalan buat 500 kilometer per year. I mean, di, kalau dimasuk buat 10 patrols a year lah, taman negara ni tu on foot, not kendaraan all that lah. I think we have to. I think it's good. We need this separate on food, on boat, on kendaraan. Uh, what we want is a food one. <laughs> That's where the effective patrolling is. And uh, the, uh, the other one, uh, leading, what would be the cost? Cost, they appear to. Boleh kita kira cost to. Because kita na back to the valuing lah. Dengan menjalankan petrol ni, kita negara dapat menjimatkan preventive lah. Loss of so many millions worth of uh, apa biodiversity resources baru Ministry of Finance kata tak mencurahkan garam dalam laut lah ni biasa dengan budget ni oh so many millions in overtime and allowances not ni boleh buat dua tiga sekolah we put up buildings and buildings lah tadi kata but kita manage to save so many millions in the thank you terima kasih kepada yang komen dan uh, tanya soalan tadi pada untuk suri um, GPS yang kita terima uh, untuk masalah smart tu kalau ada macam error apa kita akan repair dulu dalam base camp ataupun Maxsoft sebelum kita masuk ke dalam smart sebab pertama uh, kalau GPS 60 CSX dia boleh guna Maxsoft untuk download kalau GPS 62 Montana Oregon ataupun model yang lagi atas kita kena copy dia punya file itu dalam GPS sebab dia data kebanyakan data dia by day kita kena upload oh, day by day kalau untuk yang uh, Dr. Siva itu, uh, itu satu soalan yang bagus sebab kita boleh nilai balik macam effort untuk setiap petrol kita boleh nilai uh, apa yang kita buat contohnya uh, berapa setiap jam atau setiap hari untuk setiap orang berapa kita dah bayar kita boleh calculate untuk berapa jumlah yang kita belanja dan kawasan yang kita jaga tu kita boleh nilaikan untuk berapa apa tadi tu ah 
mana kita boleh nilai balik apa yang uh, apa yang kita buat program untuk kita protect macam di tangan negara berapa nilai yang kita nak protect itulah. Hai gitu. So I may refer to the first questions about can we use this system to to map other ecosystem. Actually um, what I'm presenting here is totally purely GIS. There's nothing on the remote sensing. So that's the reason why we map those hill manually. And previously, I'm talking about this ecosystem first. So previously, there are some attempt to use those remote sensing technology by using satellite, different type of image. It's very difficult to identify those hills. And <coughs> for for the forest cover that we use, actually, are those that have already published that done by somebody, some other people. Yeah. So I don't think there's. And this is not really on the remote sensing, really on the GIS. So it's about, it's about mapping, do the analysis, and share the result. That's all. It's, it's, some, it's something that's very, very simple. Even the primary school children can do that. We try already. No problem. Yeah. And about the data sharing, so actually this is an issue actually. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not from the potato area manager perspective, but as a scientist, we really need to report the exact location because science is about the reproducibility. You have to make sure what you say is correct. But somehow, there are some occasions that some scientists, they don't really report the exact location. I mean, you don't really provide the GPS. You just mention briefly where you found them, and it's allowed, actually. So go back to your point. So the things here that I show you, actually, is all those data that we can share. So for those data we cannot share, of course, we will not share. But the problem is now it's not very really clear what type of the data we can share, we cannot share. So if you according to the government classification of the document, so you have the top secret, secret, confidential, restricted. Other than that, all the data should be shareable. Okay. And last year, the um, uh, state secretary, uh, Dr. Ali Hamsa, he issued a percolating to all the department, from the state or from the national level, federal level, all the way to the Jambatan. He's talking about the Pelasanaan Data the Booker Sector Awam. So they encourage all the agency to share their data. And not only share the PTF, you know. What they talk about is the data, the book, open data. So there's a 10 criteria. You have to make sure your data is open. Allow people to use without restriction. So actually, this is what we are still lacking now, actually. So we, we, we spend a lot of time to repeat the words some other people have already done. Okay? So I think that in the future, when this is become clearer, when every agency share their data, then we can make a better decision based on the info, more information that we got. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh. Um, actually, very good question. But uh, for now, we have not, I'm not able to 100% answer your question because I also don't know. Partly because also we don't, uh, we didn't have the resources to monitor phenology. A lot of it is actually observation. And what from what we have observed is that um, obviously the palms uh, have a certain um, fruiting and flowering pattern. Figs, of course, we know they are asynchronous and you know they fruit as and when, depending on the species. Um, but having said that, um, it's a question that I hope perhaps also to look into, to tackle, uh, trying to build a PhD uh, right now. Uh, I'm enrolled in uh, UPM. God knows when I'm going to finish, but other dire lah, not what lah. So after being involved in so long, hopefully it'll, it'll help me, help me, and at the end help MNS, and at the end help the rest of our friends uh, in conservation better understand uh, hornbills. Surin, question. Um, good question, actually. But I have the slide, but I don't have it here. So the question is hornbill diversity. Actually, the slide I show you is hornbill diversity per country. So Malaysia ten, Myanmar ten. Philippines 10, so we're in second place after Indonesia and Thailand. Now, what you ask is actually hornbill's diversity per site. Now, I, I did uh, some rough uh, comparison. I've compared with sites in Malaysia, Taman Negara, uh, Danum, Malayau, uh, Indonesia also as well, uh, some sites in Thailand, I think Khao Yai, uh, I took one, and another one I can't remember, uh, Hoi Ka Keng, uh, uh, Yai Hoi Ka Keng, I did also in, in Myanmar and, and India. And guess what? The only three sites in the world, you know, three sites, 
individually have 10 hornbill species. Ulu Muda, Belum Temenggo, Banglang National Park, and Halabala. So it's brilliant because I can draw an imaginary line buat segi tiga. No lah, Dr. Siwa, round, round have no kick. Segi tiga because we can call it hot. Uh, you know what hot stands for? Hornbill triangle. Uh, everybody likes acronyms, so I have to figure out what's the best name to put it, so we call it hornbill triangle. And if you can't remember hot, remember Paris Hilton lah. But they're kata, it's hot kan? So it's hot right now. Thank you.